Well, hello. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to talk about sepsis three, the all male contribution to sepsis. Uh, it was relatively uh, uh, disgusting that it was all male. Uh, I can only say that I wasn't responsible for uh, who was uh, invited. Uh, this was an effort uh, sponsored by ESICM and SCCM. And uh, they had, the idea was to revisit the definitions of uh, sepsis. Why? Well, uh, a couple of reasons. Um, there was a sense that... Um, the existing definitions that had come out from 1991 and then updated in 2003 were sort of a little bit unclear, but um, posited the idea that sepsis was based on SIRS, and there'd been a bunch of papers that had come out that things like Jean-Louis Vincent's paper that said, dear SIRS, thank you SIRS, but we don't like you SIRS. Uh, papers that had suggested that being in hospital meant you had SIRS, going for a jog meant that you had SIRS and so forth. And so people were feeling like it, they weren't necessarily particularly useful. Uh, and then there was this term severe sepsis. And people would go, severe sepsis? Yes, severe sepsis. So what's sepsis? Sepsis that's not severe or sepsis is sepsis is both severe sepsis and not severe sepsis. And there was a sense that it was confusing. Uh, and then it's also true that people felt that um, in the 15 years or so since the last uh, 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 sepsis consensus criteria, we'd learned a lot about the basic science of sepsis. In fact, the Nobel Prize had been handed out in 2011, uh, largely for teasing out a lot of innate immunity uh, responses that were key to our understanding the host response. And a whole set of things had changed since the last time anyone had written anything about clinical criteria. And so um, this task force got I'm going the wrong way. So this task force got together, um, and they met over a two or three year period, and that culminated in three papers that were all published together back to back in JAMA um, about 18 months ago now. Um, now, it addressed both sepsis and septic shock. I can only speak for a few minutes, so I'm just going to ignore septic shock. I've already given talks on septic shock this morning. I'll just talk about sepsis in general and in particular about something that gets lots of letters to the editors, and that's QSOFA, and we'll come up with that in a minute. So the main document was this consensus document. It was about 19 people who had deliberated um, back and forth on a bunch of issues, and one of the things that uh, I was responsible for was trying to bring data to the definition. So one of the things that I, I, I don't know if the definitions are any good or not, but I like that the process involved not just old white guys, but old white guys with data. Next time we'll have old and young, uh, multicolored, multi-sex people, but it's still good to move towards having data inform the deliberations instead of just expert opinion. So um, a couple of things happened on the way to the fair. Uh, on almost the first day, uh, I asked the group, are we defining infection? Because it's not clear to me we have the right people in the room if we're defining infection. And everyone said, no, no, no. We're not going to redefine infection. There are CDC criteria and ICAC criteria and IDSA criteria. But we are looking at among patients who are infected, which ones are septic? And that was essentially the essence of the deliberations. Where does sepsis distinguish itself from infection that is not septic? And so a couple of things came up. Um, it wasn't clear that that was just having SIRS criteria, because SIRS is a partly about mounting a response to infection. It doesn't necessarily imply sepsis. Um, Sepsis is the idea that it's an infection that's somehow gone wrong. It's a bad infection. And one of the things that came out is, well, what do you mean by bad? And then people said, well, like you compromise vital organs. And what do you mean by vital organs? Well, organs that are vital. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, if you don't have them, you die. And so that ended up getting to a pretty <laughs> generic phrase, which is sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction, organ dysfunction that could end your life. Um, 
caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Now, the, a couple of things that happen here, everyone just got rid of the phrase severe sepsis. This is what used to be called severe sepsis. Severe sepsis was the sepsis that had organ dysfunction. And there's a lot of to and fro about that, but the, the bottom line was that they just felt the general, it, there's increasing awareness in the general public, and the general public never distinguished between sepsis and severe sepsis. This was a construction that we'd made inside our world, and we'd probably made things more complicated than necessary. So that was the main reason for converting the old phrase severe sepsis to sepsis. So sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. Dysregulated host response, God knows what that means. I think what we're trying to say is that it's not the bug that kills you. It's often your own response to it. But we don't actually know how to measure dysregulated. So this is a conceptual definition, but it's not clinical criteria. If you have a high IL-6 level or a high TNF level, is that dysregulated? I have no idea. I don't know how much TNF is a good amount of TNF for a certain amount of E. coli in your blood. No one really knows. So it's a conceptual definition that the host response is unhelpful, but we don't actually know how to measure a dysregulated from a regulated host response. Now, <coughs> So that was the main paper. Uh, accompanying the paper were some of the data analyses that informed it. One of them was, was led by a faculty member in my department, Chris Seamer, where we tried to address and unpack some of these issues. So if sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to infection, what might the clinical criteria be for trying to choose that? And that, first of all, infection, means the denominator would be all patients you thought were infected. And then the people who had sepsis would then be perhaps the ones who fare badly. Because if they're faring badly, that means, you know, somehow their, their life is, a, is threatened, etc. And so then, how do you define fares badly, or doing shittily, or having a crap time, or... And, there's no gold standard for this. Um, so fears badly is really just a proxy for sepsis. And this is a so-called measure of predictive validity. So if you think that among all infected patients, those who are septic are more likely to die than features among infected patients that predict death, um, especially predict death you wouldn't otherwise have expected, are correlating with sepsis. That doesn't mean to say it is sepsis. This is, again, it's predictive validity. And this is analogous to what psychiatrists would do when they were trying to work out our paranoid delusions, a feature of schizophrenia. Um, or so, so you're looking at features that correlate with the disease either at the same time, which is concurrent validity, or downstream. Events that su subsequently happen that are more common with that disease, that would be a measure of predictive validity. So we weren't, tr as I mentioned, studying criteria for infection, and we weren't also trying to build an alert or a sniffer for non-infected patients. What we were doing was taking among patients who were infected, that was the cohort, we were looking at cases, people that did badly, and you could define doing badly in different ways, and then seeing what predicted that. And so we had to think about data sets, how to identify infection, what clinical criteria to study, and who defines fair badly. So the primary data set we used was everyone that walked through the door in any of the UPMC hospitals, which at the time were about 15 hospitals, teaching hospitals and community hospitals in southwest Pennsylvania, and we had about 150,000 cases. We had full electronic data every minute of everything that happened to these patients and not just in the ICU, in the ED, even the people that were sent home from the ED, uh, in the hospital, on the floor, and so forth, and then we divided them in half. Uh, it was actually about 1.3 million records, but there were about 150,000 patients that met our criteria for being infected. 
Uh, and then we had a bunch of external data sets, about another 700,000 records, uh, largely from the United States, but also some German data. No, nothing from low and middle in income countries. And we also had pre-hospital data and emergency department data. So we had even data from patients in ambulances th that we could look at as well. So how did we identify infection in all of this? Um, we basically used electronic records to search for instances where people both were cultured up and got antibiotics and got a true course of antibiotics, so getting rid of perioperative antibiotics and so forth. And then you have to work out when is time zero. And the only time zero we can have is when the physician thinks the infection started. But we couldn't get inside the brains of the physician, but we could see the first of their actions of in moments when you saw within an overlapping time period of sending off cultures and starting antibiotics, which happened first. And so between admission to the ED, there would be a time of suspected infection, and we had windows, both a wide window for doing cultures and antibiotics and a narrow window of just six hours. So we ranged it from six to 72. And although I'm not gonna show you these data, er every analysis we ran, it made no difference whether we did it six versus 72 hours. And then in terms of what clinical criteria to study, the 2001, the so-called sepsis two criteria, had an infamous table one that listed signs and symptoms possibly associated with sepsis. And it just listed every possible thing you could imagine. And so we said, well, let's look at everything we can find, which is basically all the bits of SIRS. It's all the bits of the SOFA score. It's all the bits of the logistic organ dysfunction score, along with lots of other things. And uh, then we had to just see whether it predicted outcomes. And there are lots of things you could look at. You could have clinical review committees read every chart and try to work out who did you think actually had a bad course of sepsis. We had 150,000 cases of infection. We weren't going to do a clinical review of 150,000 charts. Um, so we ended up, at least for these analyses, doing death in the hospital and prolonged stay in the ICU. That's not to say that you can't do additional analyses in the future. Um, so we looked at 150,000 cases, we split them in half. And the first thing I want to show you here is just what data looked like. So what you have here are in the top, patients who were in the ICU, and in the bottom, pa patients who were outside the ICU. And you have SIRS criteria, SOFA score, and LOD score. And you can see that the outside the ICU tends to be uh, left shifted. So for example, if you look in the middle, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. If you look over here, the SOFA score outside the ICU, there's lots of zeros and ones. Whereas in the ICU, people tend to have big fat SOFA scores. And of course they do, because when you have more organ dysfunction, you get admitted to the ICU and you measure things. There's lots of missingness on SOFA scores when you're outside the ICU because people don't send lab tests off every single day. So right off the bat, it makes you begin to realize that things that we use in the ICU might not actually perform as well and even predicting bad outcomes when used in other environments. So in addition to looking at existing scores like SOFA and LODs, we ran this regression model on anything and everything. And what came out of it was what we ended up calling QSOFA. Now we didn't invent QSOFA, QSOFA came from the regression model. It just so happened that three things came out, respiratory rate, altered mentation, and systolic blood pressure. These were the things that bubbled together and we called it QSOFA <laughs> because I thought, well, this is quite interesting, but Jean-Louis Vincent is in uh, our committee, and he'll be very upset if I propose a new score. Even though it's from 150,000 patients, he won't like SOFA being challenged. So I said, I said let's just call it quick SOFA and then we'll keep the name SOFA and he'll be pleased. So it turns out he was very upset with the name QSOFA, but everyone else liked it, so QSOFA stuck. So it was invented to try to appease one person and it didn't work, but uh, 
but nonetheless, we now have QSOFA. So QSOFA, I quite liked because although it came from the regression model, it actually had a lot of, um, it looks like lots of other scores. It looks like the news criteria and the muse criteria. It's basically threats to the brain, the heart, and the lungs. These are arguably the most vital organs, and so it's almost not surprising that they bubble to the surface. Now, in the ICU, when you can measure everything, a full organ failure score like SOFA or LODS was still better at predicting death. Um, but um, when you looked outside the ICU, it turned out that QSOFA was actually doing as well, if not better, than SOFA because SOFA is empty half of the time outside the ICU. It's actually too complicated outside the ICU. There's a whole bunch of missing variables that just have to be assumed to be normal. All right, now this is, it's, this is a hard graph to, to read, and I figured about taking out this slide, but I think it's important to look at it. What you have here is on the y-axis log fold change going from 1 to 10 fold to 100 fold. This is the odds of death and the increase of the odds of death by baseline risk. So this is getting a how many extra deaths. It's not predicting death. It's predicting the deaths you wouldn't have expected by decile of risk. So over on the left, you have like young, healthy people with no comorbidity. And over on the right, you have really old people with COPD, et cetera, who have a high chance of dying anyway. And then it asks the question that conditional upon who you are, how much does your risk change if you turn positive with QSOFA or with SIRS, et cetera? And you can see that in black is SIRS, which is largely running along the bottom. It's still more than one, so being SIRS positive is worse than being SIRS negative. But in red is QSOFA, which is, it looks pretty close, but actually these are log fold changes. So you can't see it very well on the graph, but it's far higher odds of death with QSOFA. So QSOFA was consistently working very well. And it also worked well in external data sets. A lot of people were using lactate to screen for sepsis, and so they're saying, wait a minute, you don't have lactate in the model? Are you kidding me? You've you got to have lactate in the model. Lactate is a tremendous marker of badness. And we said, yeah, I'd love to have lactate in the model, <laughs> but this is what happens when you put lactate in the model. Red is QSOFA plus lactate, and that brown color is QSOFA without lactate. They're identical because the people who have high lactates are the people who have altered mentation and hypotension and tachycardia. <laughs> so <laughs> there's tremendous overlap. So there was no added information from the lactate on average in this cohort. So we concluded in the ICU, SOFA and LODs have good predictive uh, validity and they're better than QSOFA or SIRS. And so the consensus uh, experts then said, okay, we have to draw a line in the sand. We will just say SOFA points of two or more divide infected patients into low risk of dying versus high risk of dying. Sepsis is bad infection. So we will say sepsis is infection plus two new SOFA points. It's just clinical criteria. It's not a gold standard. It's just an operational way of defining it. But outside the ICU, QSOFA was actually behaving very well for also finding those infected patients who were at the highest risk and they looked sick. It's not as sophisticated as doing full SOFA, but that's why it ended up in the paper. All right, so there's definitely some caveats, implications, next steps. It was all retrospective. On the other hand, sepsis 1 and sepsis 2 had no data. Um, it finds who does badly. That's just a proxy for being septic because we don't actually know what sepsis is. It has no blood tests in QSOFA. Now, I think that that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Blood tests are very objective and they give nice values, 
but, um, and they're in certain ways easier than, say, doing a Glasgow Coma Scale, but not having blood tests means you can do it anywhere. You can do it on the ambulance, you can do it in austere settings. So if it were to hold up, it could be a prompt for more careful monitoring, uh, but then even if it prompted you to tell you, send this patient to the ICU, we already know with things like rapid response teams, finding patients early and sending them to the ICU hasn't actually thus far improved outcomes, but nonetheless. So I would normally stop here, but I'm going to show you just two or three more slides and then I'll be done. Since this time, we've been doing some more work. So there's been a couple of papers published by other people um, suggesting that QSOFA continues to correlate with mortality, but quite a lot of people were really upset about how, about how does QSOFA change over time? And what does it mean to have a QSOFA point of one? We, we had said if it was two or more, that was bad. But that was assuming zero and one were the same thing. All right, so <clears throat> in the same data set, what you have on the left is a heat map of how the QSOFA evolves over 40 hours for all 150,000 patients from the first moment that the clinicians thought they were infected. And the first column's in zero, and it's both for survivors and non-survivors. Uh, survivors up top, no, sorry, these are dead and survivors. And if you're a zero, uh, you start out green and you stay green. If you're a one, it's in the middle. If you're a two, it's sort of in the middle. And if you start out bad, you are often staying bad. Um, if we then started building a model that instead of just taking the baseline initial QSOFA, you could actually consider taking evolution of QSOFA scores over time, you actually got improved prediction. And it basically boils down to this. If you go to the bedside in a patient who looks to be infected, two-thirds of the time in, these cohort, in this cohort, the score is zero. And right off the bat, they only end up having a 1% mortality, an all-comer 1% mortality, very low risk. If in 1 in 14 patients, the score is 2+, plus, and it usually stays high, and they have a very, oh, they have a very high mortality rate. In the middle, the people who have a score of one, that's a quarter of the patients. Three quarters of these patients stay low and they have a low mortality, but one in four climb over the next 48 hours and they have a high mortality. So it does actually look like triage. If you're zero, it's very low risk, it's good news. If you're two or higher, it's very bad news. And if you're one, you should do some watchful waiting. And if indeed someone starts to do worse, then that would be a reason for triaging. So anyway, and this is under review. The other thing is, uh, what about in low and middle income countries? So Christina Rudd has pulled together an amazing consortium of about eight uh, cohorts from um, Africa, Asia, and Latin America representing several thousand patients. And they're in the floor, in the emergency department, in the ICU, in all sorts of settings in low and middle income countries. And just broadly speaking, uh, in blue is QSOFA and in um, orange is SIRS, and the top is the distribution. So you can see from 0, 1, 2, and 3, there's a nice spread of QSOFA scores and there's a nice spread of SIRS criteria. But then when you just look at the mortality rates, uh, there's a sequential considerable step up in mortality rates with QSOFA, whereas SIRS has a much poorer relationship with mortality. So at least at first blush, it looks like QSOFA may also have some value even in low and middle income settings. With that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? Also have a look here. You know that you can still use the app. Um, we do have a question here. How can lack of knowledge of baseline SOFA be dealt with in the setting of sepsis? Huh. <laughs> so um, the general approach about not knowing baseline SOFA, in the 
uh, has been to do the same thing that was actually used in the severe sepsis randomized trials over the last 10 or 15 years. So if you, it's assumed that in most instances it would be normal, and most of the time that's okay. So for example, for cardiovascular sofa, when you come into the hospital, it's very hard to be on vasopressors at home. For respiratory, you usually know if someone was already on the ventilation when they came in from home. There are definitely issues with things like creatinine. So I think the renal sofa, you sometimes don't know when the, if the creatinine is low and the first time you measure it, it's fine. But if you come in and you have an elevated creatinine, it's a bit of a guess about whether you think that creatinine has been elevated for ages or it just began to climb over the weekend right before you came into the hospital. So it's, it's definitely a problem. I would actually say there's lots of problems <laughs> with the criteria. It's, um, it's, not just, it's not just not a gold standard, it's sort of like a lead standard. It's, uh, I think it's the best of what's available, but that's only, that's a pretty low bar. Can you give a comment on what's happened with the pyro system in the sepsis uh, two? Pyro. So pyro, um, no one can do much with pyro when you don't have positive trials. So pyro is predisposition, infection, response, and outcome. And that was a concept trying to take the, the TNM classification of tumor nodes and metastases that were used in cancer like Duke staging, etc. And the idea was that when you take a tumor and you do a TNM staging, you can predict prognosis but also response to prognosis, like the treatment, the TNM staging would, would, would affect not only whether the patient lived or died, but also what treatment they would get and how effective different treatments would be based on TNM staging. Pyro was articulated conceptually by John Marshall, but the problem is the most valuable piece of it is this notion of um, what would predict the right treatment and the right response? The idea being that you would, the predisposition would be things like genetic underpinning or what the particular organism was. Well, uh, the I is the organism. The, pre, the P was all about the underlying host status. And then you would, you would be able to measure response. But we've <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we don't have any, at the time it came out, I guess people were feeling good about the Anand study of steroids, the Zygris study, and they were probably thinking in a couple more years we'll have half a dozen therapies for sepsis. And then we'll be able to nicely map which therapy works for which combinations. So that's, pyro is parked on a dusty shelf, waiting for the moment when we have several therapies to choose from, and then we're trying to work out which therapy works best across which p particular landscape of sepsis phenotypes. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.